You recommended we listen to Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers by Wu-Tang Clan, and I listened to it for a month. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spin It, the record-ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James, and with me is Connor. Do you know what you're going to say before you say it? What, at the beginning? Just, like, in life. Oh, in life? Yeah, I, sometimes. Obviously, there's an element of improvisational reaction in a conversation, but I don't script my life. Well, no, no. I just mean, like, let's say somebody asked you a question. Do you know what your answer is going to be or, like, the words that are going to come out of your mouth before they actually come out of your mouth? Yeah, usually. I have some idea of where they're going. Do you? I don't think I do, and I think that's part of the problem I have. <laughs> <laughs> What makes you say that? I've been doing some soul searching between episodes, and uh, I think part of the what makes me fun improvically made that word up. I, th I think that's part of it. <laughs> You're proving your point. Is also what makes me struggle sometimes to speak. Mm, the words make themselves as they come out. I don't, I don't know how to give a good example. <laughs> I feel like you're all self-conscious now. I know, right? I am. But, like, that right there, like, the sentence, I know, right, I am, that, like, didn't pop in my brain. My, I heard it for the first time as I was saying it. Hmm, I see. And I feel like that's just how I live life. Fair enough. <laughs> like, I think that's why I sometimes struggle to come up with bantery things for the beginning of these episodes and why I was complaining so much about you always saying the same things to me and me always having the same responses. Like, <laughs> it's me. Yeah. That's what this is about. When, that when I try to think about what I'm going to say, it's never as good as when I just say things. I, I shouldn't say never, but I feel like the majority of the time. Okay. Well, I mean, it is a recorded podcast. If you do say something and you don't want to say it, you could just say something different and no one would ever know. Yeah, well, you're editing it, so I know that's not true. I would know. <laughs> that's true. You would leave it in out of spite. No, no. If you say, please cut it, it's usually cut. Mm. But like, you don't hear yourself in your head before you speak or you do hear myself no but do i know what i'm gonna say do you, or like do the words pop into your brain in any sort of way that like if somebody was like talking to you and i was like i had a pretty good day today and your response ended up being my day was pretty good too would you know that you were gonna say the sentence my day was pretty good too before your ears heard you say it yes okay i need a bigger sample size if only you had a platform to solicit information. I'll just ask the mix taper. Yeah. I feel like he has the same problem as you, though. If I had to guess. <laughs> that makes it two against one, and that makes you the weird one, sucker. <laughs> I think you need a bigger sample size. <laughs> so this week we are talking about the Wu-Tang Clan, and this one was a, a fan-recommended episode. Shout out to Nor, hashtag friend of the colonel, for the recommendation. They said we should listen to Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, by the Wu-Tang Clan. Am I the only one who, when I hear Wu-Tang Clan, thinks of, like, the Tang orange juice powder? Oh, Tang. Ooh, that's a throwback. No, but what I will say is before I knew either of these bands and any of their music, I always got Wu-Tang Clan mixed up in my head with Wang Chung, which is a very different situation. Very different musically and in every way. Did you know Tang had a bunch of flavors other than orange, apparently? Yes, I heard about some of them. I was never big into Tang. I hope most of all, I don't like orange things. I'm looking at a Tang 20 sample pack. They still make Tang? Yeah. Whoa. Got mango, melon. Why didn't they call it Tango? Like the dance. <laughs> Pina. I assume it's pina colada flavored. Well, probably just pineapple. One just that says Jamaica. It's what? Just flavored like Jamaica? I guess. Okay. One that says mandarina. Probably Spanish for mandarin orange. Just another kind of orange. Yeah, are all these things, they're in different languages. Pina is also Spanish. 
Well, I don't know if I'm looking at like a variety pack that like was sold somewhere. <laughs> you might just be looking at Spanish Tang. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that it is because this one here is Limonada Fresa, which I think is strawberry lemonade. Okay. Piece of a lemon and a piece of a strawberry on the packaging. Mm-hmm. This one's called Horchata. Horchata? What's that? Horchata, that's its own kind of flavor. That sounds familiar. Like I've heard it. Yes. This one says Uva. That's grape, apparently. Yeah, this is not English Tang. You're just reading flavors in other languages. But I save 7% if I buy more. If you buy more Tang? You save 100% if you buy none. But it's a 20 Tang sample pack, so I'd be getting 40 Tang. 40 is too much Tang. Well, this has been our Opry Tangent. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's been a Tang tang Tangent. To be honest, I'm surprised that you are putting all this Tang talk here, because I half assumed that the mixtaper would have at least one fact about Tang. I mean, he might. <laughs> so back on track. This was a fan recommendation that's why I put it on Albums of the Month. Honestly, I, I did it way back in April, like a full six months ago. But I needed to find the right time to fit it into the podcast. And this is that time. We made it. And I've got to tell you, some of the hooks from this record have been in my head for the last six months. It's been, I mean, near torturous. Just how often I think of some of these songs. Mm. Which is wild. I did not expect that. So you're saying it's a good recommendation. It definitely has been, yeah. A historic one, you know, a lot of influence in this album. It's a memorable one. Hmm. It's, it's interesting, and it's not necessarily the kind of thing I would have looked into at this point by myself. It led me to this, which was cool. Now, I don't get the sense that you're a huge Wu-Tang Clan fan. Well, what gave you that? Just in general. I mean, you don't really like rap a ton. It's not your primary genre. And uh, this album also exhibits some traits that you also have found unfavorable in the past. Like, uh, like talking. Listen, I don't even know what my thoughts are going to be before I say them. You think I know what my score is going to be before we get there? I mean, I <laughs> feel like you have some idea, but... A little peek behind the curtain. <laughs> true enough. I don't know what number is going to come out of my mouth. That's not true. You, you always know. And you should be worried. I'm not worried. This isn't my recommendation. I mean, it's part of the year of healing, right? So I feel like this one has the potential, maybe, to be for you a speed bump in the healing process. But I can't be 100% sure. Mm. We'll have to find out. My thoughts are unknowable, even to me. True enough. <laughs> so think back to our episode on A Tribe Called Quest. Episode 86. Tribe Called Quest. Yeah. We talked a lot about the state of hip-hop in the late 80s, the early 90s. Very, you know, jazz-infused, very ideologically focused, and really clean. Surprisingly so, to our ears now. Almost to the point of being like a family-friendly album, at least in terms of language. Ah, yes. My five nines out of ten. That's right. You gave A Tribe Called Quest five nines. But it is, you know, a very early hip-hop is different than this. Wu-Tang Clan is one of the biggest early influences in breaking that mold. The jazz sounds disappear in favor of this grittier, more raw kind of sound. The lyrics take on a totally new dimension. The rap we all know and love today. The rap we all know and love today was born from, I mean, yes, stuff like A Tribe Called Quest. From the loins of Wu-Tang. I don't know about specifically born from, but definitely was uh, evolved by the loins of Wu-Tang. Evolved by the loins of Wu-Tang. <laughs> what? Yeah, something like that. Inspired yeah. by the loins of Wu-Tang. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. I'm in a weird mood tonight. What's wrong with me? <laughs> but the language gets more harsh. I don't know if you noticed. This one's a little bit more profane and... Harsh language? A little bit. Right. It gets more intense. A little grittier, dirtier. The imagery intensifies and you know hip-hop does just expand from this so like as you listen to it contextualize this episode and this album in that time and in that world and like think of all the boundaries that this was pushing when it came out i thought it was really neat to compare and contrast it to the low end theory all the ways it's similar and different all the things that the tribe called quest did that wu-tang clan doesn't and vice versa it was neat like a tribe called quest the wu-tang clan is a new york city hip-hop collective they evolved from a group of cousins variously known as the force of the imperial master and the all in together now crew had a couple different names. In 1991, members Robert Diggs and Gary Grice got the nod from rapper Biz Markey, and they were signed to separate record labels. Not together, just separately. They went and did their own thing, but both of them quickly got dropped. But they didn't let that discourage them, and they started to put together their own group alongside Dennis Coles and Russell Jones. They decided that they wanted this group they were making to embody a combination of, as they say, 
Eastern philosophy picked up from Kung Fu movies, comic books, and 5% nation teachings, which is a black nationalist movement with roots in Islam stemming from the mid-1960s. So right away, like A Tribe Called Quest, you can see this pretty clear tendency towards ideology, towards social activism, but there are a few new elements blended in there as well that make their way into the album's sound and style. Specifically with the novelty stuff like Kung Fu movies and comic books, how familiar are you with those old-timey, like, cheesy Kung Fu movies? I've seen Kung Fu Panda. Kung Fu Panda is not quite this, but like, I guess it's in the spirit. I've seen the Karate Kid. Yeah, not that either, though. Like, <laughs> hmm. I've seen some Jackie Chan movies, like the one where he's a babysitter, but also like an, a CIA agent or something like that. What's that one? Okay, sure. The Spy Next Door, 2010. Oh, 2010? No, think like 1970, 1960. Oh, oh. Like older. Oh. I've seen uh, The Way of the Dragon. Okay. Got Bruce Lee in it. Does that count? Yeah, I think that's a little closer. That's 1972. Yeah. I've also seen Fist of Fury, actually, also Bruce Lee. I've seen mainly Bruce Lee. Fair enough. And Jackie Chan as a babysitter. Well, you're doing better than me. I haven't seen very many kung fu movies, to be perfectly honest. Mm. So that element of this interpolation on this album is a little lost on me, but not really. Like, I could still appreciate the vibe they're going for, I guess. Overall, sounds like we're not too familiar with kung fu movies, but that's okay. Yeah. So that's their background in kung fu, in comic books, and in 5% Nation stuff. So they also decide they need some nicknames. Heck yeah. That's going to be essential if they're going to be successful rappers, right? No one's going to come listen to Robert, Gary, Russell, and Dennis. Well, of course. You know, they need better stuff going on. To be fair, I would. Probably. That sounds like an edgy emo punk band. <laughs> Maybe. Well, they changed their names up a little bit. Robert Grice goes with Rizza. Rizza! And Gary Grice follows suit with his nickname, Jizza. Heck yeah. RZA, GZA. Great follow up. Go on. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure people knew that's how you spell it. Then there's Russell Jones, formerly known as the Specialist, who changed his moniker to ODB, <laughs> Old Dirty Bastard. ODB! You sound like a fan. Now, you're going all in. You know all the nicknames and stuff. Listen, you're the one who asserted I would not be. That's true. I did project that onto you. So we'll see. And then Dennis Coles is the ghost, ghost face. Ghost face! Ghost in face killer. If we got any ghost face in the house, you best be leaving because ghost face killer is here. <laughs> oh, like the ghost face was going to get killed by the ghost face killer? Yeah. He's not a killer with a ghost face? Okay. Oh, I just assumed. He was a killer who killed ghost fists. Maybe. I, I guess I don't know. Let's move on. We got some other killers to talk about. Go on. We have a lot of other people in the band. By the time this debut record came out, the group would also pick up Method Man, Raekwon, Inspected Deck, You God, and Master Killer. The killer of masters. That's right. I have to be honest. I think, I mean, we've talked about bands with a lot of members over time right? Uh, like, yes comes to mind. And Earth, Wind, and Fire comes to mind. Bands that have had a lot of people through the years. Journey comes to mind. Journey, too. I think Wu-Tang Clan might be the biggest group we've talked about at once. <laughs> like, there are nine of them. That's not true. Isn't it? Who's been bigger than nine? I can't remember off the top of my head. We did George Gershwin. He had an entire symphony. Okay, of chill out. <laughs> <laughs> you and your Rhapsody in Blue on the one singles episode. The best rap. Taking everything away from me. <laughs> I couldn't say Duke Ellington was the first born of our artists because George Gershwin beat him by seven months. I can't say the Wu-Tang was the largest group because I guess there's a symphony involved. Okay, it's technicalities. So they've got their direction. They've got their stage names out of the way. Wu-Tang Clan officially comes into being in 1992. Their name, predictably, is derived from a 1983 kung fu movie, Shaolin and Wu-Tang. With RZA kind of as their default leader and their producer, they get to work making music. In 1993, they put out Protect Your Neck as an independent single, and they start to make waves in the underground rap scene. Doesn't take long for them to find a label home in RCA Records, who in an extraordinary move, signs them to a record contract where they get to record albums together as the Wu-Tang Clan, and then they can also have the freedom to break up and record solo albums separately on different labels, which is incredibly unique. Whoa, on different labels? Whoa. Yeah, they gave them freedom to go explore. And probably also because they didn't want to take on <laughs> nine solo contracts at once, you know? Why not? That's hefty. I don't know. Then you just have a lot of responsibilities to a lot of people to put out a lot of music. 
Fair enough. Yeah, but that signing with RCA led them straight to their first album, the one we're talking about today, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers. They spent the better part of 1992 and 93 recording the album with RZA, who produced the entire thing. Obviously, they don't have a big budget. They don't have a ton of experience. They ended up recording in a tiny New York studio, and at the time, they had nine members in the group. Some of these songs feature eight of them recording in the studio at the same time. But, of course, not all these songs have enough space for eight people to rap, so sometimes they had to do rap battles to figure out who would be featured on songs. We should do a rap battle to see who gets to pick, like, an episode one time. (laughs) That would be fun. I don't like that we've signed up for this. I know. Well, I, I'm absolutely going to lose. Why did I do this? We can back out at any time. Like right now. I'm backing out. Okay. Well, that plane crumbles. <laughs> Consider my back out. <laughs> but the rest of me is still in. Oh, you're just fronting then. It's, I'm calling your bluff. <laughs> See, this is how I know I'm going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know, though, because your brain might think of really good raps before you even think them. That's a good point. And if it was like an improv, like freestyle rap sort of thing, I might have a shot. That's what rap battles usually are. They don't write those out. Oh, I don't get I don't get to write mine out ahead of time? No. The album also digs into some audio samples, uh, of course, as to be expected from this age of hip-hop. Lots of their music is built around soul music, as opposed to jazz like we've seen in the past. And they borrowed a lot of sound effects from their namesake Kung Fu movie, and also 1979's Ten Tigers from Quang Tung. They even named the album after a different kung fu movie, one that I've actually heard of a little bit, the 36th Chamber of Shaolin. In the movie, I'm sure you're familiar with this concept, right? In the movie, there's a fighter that has to advance through 36 chambers, fighting masters of increasing difficulty Mm. to reach enlightenment and master kung fu. Kingdom Hearts 1 Coliseum. (laughs) Kind of. Or that episode (laughs) of SpongeBob where he has to go through the tower to figure out it's all about real estate and timeshares. Oh. It's the same concept. It, to put it in a totally different generational context, yes. So the parallel that the Wu-Tang Clan's trying to draw here is that they're the best in hip-hop. They're the masters in the 36th chamber. Uh. And so by engaging with them and listening to this album, it's like we're the ones entering the 36th chamber and witnessing that mastery for ourselves firsthand. Oh. Yeah, it's quite a concept. It's unique. It's niche. Very niche. It's surprising, maybe confusing, but it is so unlike anything else out there at the time. This album is kind of in a league of its own. It came out in November of 1993 and got a surprising amount of attention. It hit number 41 on the Billboard charts. In spite of its really unpolished, dirty sound, it sold 30,000 copies in its first week and it would be certified platinum within two years. Today... It's gone triple platinum. And it was, once again, just a massively significant album that really just changed the nature of the genre. Because of its content and its lasting influence, Rolling Stone deemed it the 27th best album of all time. Let that sink in for a second. 27th best album of all time. And it's been preserved in the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry. One of the things people talk about is they really praise its street sound, right? Its innovation in creating hardcore hip-hop. There's violence, there's drugs, there's crime. There's these, like, nitty-gritty real-life scenes that they really don't bother to sugarcoat even a little bit. Stylus Magazine talked about it. I found a quote from them, and I think they put it pretty well. They said, Each Wu MC links his rhymes to crime and violence, allowing his preoccupations to surface subtly and indirectly, rather than spouting off overt gangstaisms designed to shock. The hood imagery of the lyrics is utterly pervasive and uncompromising, immersing the listener in a foreign land smack in the middle of New York. There's no celebration here and little hope. So that's the long and short of the album and the debut of the Wu-Tang Clan. As for the rest of their career, they continued to release a lot of albums, both collectively and separately. So there's obviously a lot of music coming from these nine and eventually ten guys, right? Ten people making music for decades, you get a lot of stuff. They hit some speed bumps as a group in 2004. There was some tension between You God and RZA, and after a series of run-ins with the law, Old Dirty Bastard actually passed away after collapsing in the studio, which is terribly sad. But the band persisted, they kept making music and performing to present day, and one absolutely just wild thing that the Wu-Tang Clan has done that, for the record, Mixtaper 
I did know about this before I listened to this record. I know it's a cool factor spin thing, but I did already know about it. So just so you know, is he okay with that? I think you're safe. He seems unfazed. Unfazed? That's good. (laughs) So in 2014, they create this record called The Wu, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. It's a 31-track double album, and it is one of one. They never released it commercially. They only made one single copy to be toured at museums and festivals, and then eventually the plan was to have them sell it. So Mm. it was eventually sold to Martin Shkreli for $2 million, but he was arrested by the FBI for massive, massive corporate fraud, like ordered to pay $65 million to victims, $7 million in fines, like big deal white collar crime. And so he said, look, how about you take this album as part of my payment he turns the wu-tang clan album over to the government and apparently they resold it in 2021 for four million dollars to this day the album has never been released in full although there have been a tiny few clips and snippets posted and broadcast from time to time just just a little bit so there's an album out there a wu-tang album that exists that only a handful of people have heard and it's worth millions of dollars which is just really cool i think maybe that's the route we take for connor's hippin and hoppin album i like it you know we create scarcity for it which obviously drives up the price yes when you can't generate demand you get higher prices by artificially creating scarcity you can't get more scarce than one of one not true i guess zero zero. (laughs) <laughs> the album is as scarce as it will ever be right now. I wonder if they'll ever release it. I wonder if like we'll ever have a chance to hear Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. It's too soon to tell. But excluding that top secret album, in total, Wu-Tang Clan has put out six studio albums. But the extended Wu family, as they're known, of members and collaborators and affiliates of the Wu-Tang Clan has produced more than 350 records since 1994. So their reach and their influence... I mean, has been incalculable. 350 plus records is wild. And as for their accolades, they have one single Grammy nomination for Best Rap Album. And it was for their 1997 sophomore album, Wu-Tang Forever. Wow. Yeah. But that's the background. That's the Wu-Tang Clan in the nutshell. I saved a lot for the mixtaper. I deliberately tried to avoid some areas of the Wu-Tang Clan's history so that the mixtaper could have them. But I couldn't not talk about the Super Rare album. Fair enough. But let's get the mixtaper on out here and have him assert some things about the Wu-Tang Clan. And I'll tell you whether they're true or whether they're total bogus. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. Hello. Welcome back, mixtaper. You ready for a fun week? I hope it's a fun week. Is this like, oh, this is like the four chambers, right? Where they increase in difficulty as I go? No, it's still 36 chambers. 36, oh, goodness. You're starting at 33. Oh, okay. I get a, I get a pass for the first 32 chambers. That makes me feel a little better. You get 32 mulligans. I need them, believe me. Either that or each one of these is worth. You can do it. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. You got it. Nine points. So I could start on 33 or each of these facts could be worth nine points. Yeah. Nine chambers, not points. Nine chambers. I would advance nine chambers for every fact. <laughs> so let's start in chamber one. Start in the chamber one. Well. Is that your fact? Just well? <laughs> don't know in order to give you these. I thought this was another Otis Redding, Jimmy Carter kind of situation. Well. <laughs> Well, we're going to need to get some new squirrels for this Jizza fact. Okay. That's my fact title. That's your fact title? Okay, good grief. The deep inside joke here for you Wu-Tang fans that are not necessarily Spinet fans is that our math department that handles all of our math is run by squirrels in lab coats. It's not that deep. It's not that deep, but it's just completely unknown. So is Jizza bad at math? No, he's really good at it. How good at math? Quantum physics level good. Oh, that's pretty good. (laughs) Is that good at math necessarily or just good at physics? I mean, physics is a lot of math. Oh, there's a lot of math in physics. It's true. Physics is one of the mathiest sciences. Yeah. Right behind the science of math class that was offered. (laughs) You had to take clouds instead. (laughs) Yeah. So did he go to school for quantum physics? Did he just learn it? He went to school school to talk about quantum physics how do you mean like as a guest lecturer in the sense that he spoke at harvard whoa on the topic of quantum physics but what qualifies him to do that is what i'm saying being really smart 
and learning a lot about quantum physics as a hobby. Just on his own? Oh, no, on his own. He worked with physicists and asked him a lot of questions, you know, stuff like that, to avoid inaccuracies. And his science-inspired music gave a TED Talk on the concept of quantum physics and even founded a cool group. What group did he found? You tease these little things that you want me to ask about just by saying... Little nuggets of tease yeah. for, you to, for you to find. Yeah. What group did he found? Science Genius Battles, which the word battles is an acronym, for bringing attention to transforming teaching and learning science. Oh, so like teaching quantum physics through rap. Yeah, pretty much. Interesting. It's to motivate young high school students, especially those of the black and Latino community, to learn science through hip hop, creating scientific raps and engaging in rap battles. Did he talk at Harvard about quantum physics or did he talk at Harvard about this teaching method with quantum physics as like an example? I, I don't know. Just to me, quantum physics sounds really advanced. And if you were going to promote this, it sounds to me like this would be right up his alley. Let's put it this way. He gave a TED talk on quantum physics. Okay. And he spoke at Harvard on something related to quantum physics. Okay. I don't really know if it was about this foundation thing or if it was actually about the concept of quantum physics. Well, I love the idea of the foundation and the concept. And that seems, again, right up his alley. Like, the way I can see this playing out is he comes up with this method of teaching, then he uses it to learn about quantum physics right or teaches himself about quantum physics no it's definitely the other way around he started studying quantum physics like as a kid and continued that into his adult life wow i gotta be honest i think this is a fact i think this is a fact i think so i think he gave a talk to harvard and to ted well i don't think he gave a talk to ted but i think he gave a ted talk and founded science genius battles yeah i can get behind that sure this is a fact a fact yay i knew it I had a hunch. You had a hunch. I did. That's cool. I had no idea he was a quantum physicist. Yeah, I don't know if you should really call him that. He doesn't have a degree, but he's a quantum physics enthusiast. Well, aren't we all scientists? We all are scientists. We all use the scientific method. I'm something of a scientist myself. We make hypotheses. So that takes me into chamber nine. Chamber nine, getting harder. No, or 10. Chamber 10, getting harder. Wait, hold on. Is it chamber nine or chamber 10? It'd have to be chamber 10. Because I advanced nine, but I started in one well i guess you needed to start in chamber zero <laughs> this is chamber nine sure that that first one was to get into the chambers you were in chamber zero but here's what it is i haven't advanced past chamber nine yet gotcha yeah yeah you're like i'm in chamber nine yeah okay this wu-tang stuff we got a lot to learn really you needed to start in chamber nine right if this is fact two is nine fact three will be 18 which makes fact 427. So you really need to start in nine. And then I will be, I no, but I'll be in the 36th chamber. But then you won't beat 36. I thought you wanted to try to beat 36. Yeah, we'll see what we can do about that. Oh, okay. This is why we need better squirrels. ODB is part of an interesting group. Is that group the Wu-Tang Clan? Yeah. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> fact. Okay, what group is he a part of? Well, it's less of a... Now I think really probably shouldn't use the word group because that implies like an organized society of some sort. I don't know if it really does. Well, just like an organized demographic of people. I don't know. When I think a group, I think purposeful. This is more just like a demographic thing. It's part of an interesting demographic. Okay. What demographic is that? People who can juggle but hate juggling. What? That is an interesting demographic. I'm at war with myself. So how does he know that he can juggle? Did he? How do you know you can juggle? Well, but juggling is a thing you have to learn how to do. Yeah. And if you hate it, you're not really going to invest the time to learn how to do it. Unless I guess. I mean, what if you started hating it after you learned? That could happen. That's a possibility. Is that what happened to ODB? I don't know. Here's the problem. I found information that claims he, he claims to hate juggling. Okay. And so I was doing some further research on that and came across some survey information that said 35% of, you know, people can juggle and 70% of people hate juggling, which means there's a 5% overlap of people who can juggle but hate juggling. Well, that's not true. Do 70% of people hate to perform juggling or just hate to watch juggling? The question was simply hate juggling. I don't really think it matters. Yeah, I could hate to watch juggling but love performing it, or I could hate to perform juggling and love watching it. But how would you answer the question in that scenario? If both those things were true, how would you answer the question, do you hate juggling? Because I think that's all that really matters. I feel like I'd have to make a distinction and say, no, I don't hate it, but I can't juggle. Distinctions are not really a thing you can do on service, but I like your spirit. Uh, it's true. <laughs> you could. You could have multiple questions, you know, this column are jugglers and they said they have it anyway, whatever. You could, but this 
this survey did not. This survey simply tells me that 35% of people can juggle and 70% of people hate juggling. And that therefore is a 5% overlap of people who can juggle but hate juggling. Sure, that's fine. It's irrelevant. So we know ODB can juggle because well, he's juggled. Have we seen him juggle? We know that ODB hates juggling because he said so. Okay. And we're just assuming that he can juggle? Well, probably. Who can't juggle? What? What? <laughs> 70% of people can't juggle. This is what you're telling me. Uh, 65%, please. 65% of people can't juggle. <laughs> you can't juggle like it's a minority. Come on. I don't think we have any way we could claim this based on what you're telling me. And that concerns me because you could totally just be feeding me garbage so that I think this is a spin when it's really true. Could be. Has he talked about hating juggling? Why has this come up? In an interview he gave. About juggling? It was just like one of those things where like they ask you a bunch of weird questions to get to know you better. No way. Is it a spin? I don't, I don't buy this. This is a spin. I think your original claim that he belongs to an interesting demographic of people that hate juggling and can juggle feels weird. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good survey, just that it existed. I don't care about the survey. That's not about ODB. Oh, oh, gotcha. I feel like if this is true, he just said the full thing in an interview, and you're just throwing this survey stuff in here to mess me up. So what are you, what's your answer here? Locking in spin or going fact? What are you doing? I'm going to change it to a fact. I think this is true that he said that he can juggle, but he hates juggling. I don't know if... I mean, demographics aside, I guess. I don't know anything about that. But I think he said this. This is... A spin! <laughs> Complete and utter garbage. He did not say that. That survey does not exist. The percentage is completely made up. Yeah. Okay, but I bet he can juggle. Yeah, probably. Who can't juggle? <laughs> I can't. That sucks. You didn't present that in a very good way. Yeah, that was the point. So I lost, but I'm still going on to chamber 18. <laughs> That was the convincing you that a person could juggle but hate juggling was a fan submission. Why, well, it's totally possible. But you framed it in such a way that hating juggling and hating the act of juggling are two distinct things. Yeah. I could love to juggle but hate juggling. On the contrary, I could hate watching juggling but love to juggle. Yeah, you've explained your position on the differences between watching and performing juggling. The survey that I made up was people hate juggling. And you seem to be struggling with that one. And not to mention, I could do more than just physically juggling balls. I could also multitask in taxing ways. You know, and that's considered juggling responsibilities. I like watching people fall. I hate falling. And so I think I would answer the question, do you hate falling as yes? It was convoluted. That was way too convoluted. Yeah. Wanted to really just throw a lot of BS at you and see if I could kind of flashbang you with it yeah it was bad anyway chamber 18 or 27 depending on the math you're doing i'm not a quantum physicist rizza is a monk like lives in a monastery no oh well like what how practice monkism okay but aren't monks like don't they belong to a specific sect or like religion yeah which which one shaolin temple monks Okay, like their namesake and the, the movie and the, the whole thing. See. Si. Okay, tell me more. I know nothing. Well, in the mid-90s, Riza met, I'm so sorry, Shi Yan Ming, S-H-I-Y-A-N-M-I-N-G. That's how I'm choosing to go with that. Sure, sounds like you did that right. And began training with him three days a week in the ways of monk. Where? In New York City? Yeah. Okay. What's this training entail? How to be a monk. Right. And that includes behaviors such as? Being a better person, being a calm, putting out good energy, classic monk things. Sure. And he still does this? You said is a monk, not was a monk. I haven't come across any information saying he stopped. Though, I always picture monks as being like born 90. So... <laughs> okay, well. So, you know, uh, Xi and Ming might have croaked at this point. I mean, by 2023, this was in the 90s. So, I don't know, maybe find a new teacher or he just does it on his own now because he learned everything. I don't know. But, yeah. At one point in time, was a monk and supposedly still is. Right. Now, he is a monk, but there's a very small demographic out there that are monks but hate being monks. Yeah. He's not part of that one. Okay. I think this is a spin. A spin. I do think this is not true. This is... A fact! Oh, ouch! <laughs> the chambers are getting harder. <laughs> He's struggling. <laughs> they are. They're going up in difficulty. Time to enter chamber. 27, 36? 27, I, I think, is if we're consistent. 27. 
We still have, Joey's still out on that. I feel like you got to start at nine. Otherwise, the math doesn't work out to get the 36. We got to start at one. I can't start at nine. That's disingenuous. But you're not going to get to do chambers 28 through 36. Cause I'm on my last fact. It's final ramp. But I got to do all 36 chambers. Feels like final ramp should be 36. You're right. Maybe the last one was worth double. This is chamber 36. Oh, last one was worth double. Well, okay. I'll take two points. Sure. <laughs> well, no, not in points. Just in chambers. Just to be very clear. Gotcha. Chambers 1, 9, 18, and 36. Can chambers be like coupons where they're worth like one one hundredth of a cent so if i get a hundred chambers i can trade it in for a one hundredth of a point if you manage to get a hundred chambers on this episode oh i still this episode boo what if we have a reason to do chambers in a future episode i should be able to carry them over i mean that's how coupons work i don't want to give you that power i feel like i should have that power so what i feel like if there's ever a legitimate reason for us to be counting chambers in a future episode <sighs> fine if if there's a legitimate reason and you can't just make them 96 through 100. No. Long way to go to 100. What a mess. So what's the last fact? I'm entering the 36th chamber. Ghostface Killer wrote a play about a hard-boiled egg. The emotions that I just went through. <laughs> because at first I thought Ghostface Killer owned ghost detecting equipment. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, he wrote a play. That's cool. And then you said hard-boiled egg? Question. If I had said Ghostface Killer own ghost detecting equipment uh-huh would you have said would there have been ever a chance you said fact not at all no okay good i because i did consider it <laughs> what's a play about a hard-boiled egg even about i mean how's what's the egg do is this like humpty dumpty but he lives okay i'm annoyed you know? <laughs> <laughs> i'm annoyed oh is is it like humpty dumpty but he lives I thought for certain I was going to tell you this, and you were going to be like, no way. And then you guessed it first try. It's if Humpty Dumpty was secretly hard-boiled. Wait, really? Before getting up on that wall. And it was like, it's a whole play about him faking his own death. Ah, that's amazing. <laughs> See, I arrived at this conclusion because I was like, hmm, how many popular eggs do I know from literature? And I'll be honest, <laughs> there's only one. And I was like, like, what would an egg do? And all I could think of was fall off a wall. <laughs> and obviously a hard-boiled egg, he's got an advantage in that situation. Yep, yeah, yeah. so What's this play called? Never been released. You don't know what it's called. Why was he inspired to do this? What would inspire you to write a play about a hard-boiled egg who fakes his own death? Good question. You're the wrong person to ask that. You would just do it because you were bored. I would. Or because I dropped a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> I think those are the main two options. I, I honestly, I don't know. Is it just a play or is it a musical? Obviously, he's got musical inclinations. No, it's a play. Okay. This feels so unbelievable. I mean, you feel like you said the same thing about being a monk and about juggling, though you were right about that one. I was, <laughs> yeah. Has it been performed or published in any way? Nope. I feel like I would know what it was called if that was the case. <laughs> It's true. Just a little private hard-boiled egg play for himself. Yeah. I don't like it. This has girl named girl vibes where like it's so, it exists maybe, but doesn't exist publicly. So no one knows what it's about. I mean, I told you what it was about, but that's okay. Well, yeah, generally, but we don't know how the story unfolds or like what anything about it. Gotcha. I think this is a spin. This is a spin. <laughs> Yay. Oh, uh, I feel like I had you there for a minute and... I lost you. You were on the hook and then I got you off it somehow. I just don't think there was enough information there to keep me on the hook. I just I didn't want to give too much information because sometimes you accuse me of giving you too much information. I feel like even if it had a title, that might have sold me. Really? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I can't say for sure. But also the fact that I guessed it right off the bat probably didn't work in your favor. But you did. That's legitimately what I have written down. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> I didn't just agree with you like I've done in the past. No, but the faking his own death thing was an angle I hadn't even considered. And so I knew that was probably your plan or true. Mm. At that point, I was still on the fence. Unlike our dear protagonist, Humpty Dumpty. He was never on the fence. He was on a wall. Well, I mean, the wall was probably just used as a fence. I mean, I know one when I see it. I was just saying, like, we call it like the Great Wall of China. But it's really just a big fence. And the fence around my yard, it's just a small wall full of holes. Like, I could try to argue like a difference there. Because, like, I feel like walls are used to, like, enclose something. Like, That's a good distinction. But you can have a wall that doesn't enclose something. Name one. The Great Wall of China. It's a fence. It's my argument. <laughs> We're going down a rabbit hole that I don't think we could go down right now. So we went 50-50 this week. Uh, well, on points. But in terms of chambers, I won. You did win big on chambers. Do I get to win the 36th chamber? How does that happen? Is there a way? Well, you're in chamber 36. I feel like... 
you could have claimed to have beat the 36 chambers if you'd gotten a perfect week. But you need to go back and retry oh. whichever ones you missed. 9 and 18? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Man, I'm really disappointed I lost you on hard-boiled egg play. Because I was just afraid to give you too much information. That's catch-22 for me. I give you no information, and you're like, you don't have any information. You made this up. And then I make up a bunch of information, and you go, this seems too good to be true. You made it up. And I'm like, oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> There's a sweet spot right in the middle. Yeah. And apparently that sweet spot is juggling and just blitzing you, giving you confusing uh, surveys. I guess so. All my facts in the future will have survey information. Hard-boiled egg was another fan submission from a bit ago actually i've been waiting to work that one in so that's another thing that i thought to be perfectly honest i said this sounds like a thing he would be challenged to do yeah fans get a little better with your challenges yeah (laughs) wait so what you're saying is there is no play about a hard-boiled egg there sure is gonna be (laughs) about humpty dumpty faking his own death because that's a million dollar idea (laughs) that's copyright you can't take that that's ours humpty dumpty but yeah we went 50 50 so that means together we can make it to chamber 36. Between the two of us, we made it all the way. Perfect week if you add up our scores. Perfect chamber week. Good for us. Go us. Well, we'll see you next week for another round of Factor Spin. And I tell you, it better be chamber free. Yeah. Welcome back, Connor. Welcome back to the episode. Hello. Let's talk about the album cover of Enter the Wu-Tang. It's the band in a bunch of masks and doing Wu-Tang things. <laughs> what do you think? It's... What I would have expected. Really? This is, yeah. You tell me we're going to do a band called the Wu-Tang Clan, and this is what I would have expected to see. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, it actually feels very reminiscent of an old-timey kung fu movie. This feels like it could be a still frame from some movie somewhere. Yeah. It also looks like I'm about to get my butt kicked. Yeah. <laughs> it's very intimidating. I like the Wu-Tang Clan logo in the bottom right. Yeah, it's a cool logo, isn't it? It's a, it's a big W. Oh. Yeah. I can see that now. Well, what'd you think it was? Like, weird, abstract bird. Yeah, I also definitely get a bird impression. (laughs) Maybe butterfly or bat, depending on how you filled it in. Some sort of winged... Butterfly? It depends on how you filled in the Wu-Tang Clan name part of the logo. Yeah, 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 that's true. You can make a butterfly or bat. But I got bird. Right. I got, like, abstract bird. Well, right in line with their hardcore rap style, it was not initially supposed to be that. When they first started thinking about a logo, they wanted it to be a severed head (laughs) with blood dripping from it. They wanted it to imitate, protect your neck. That is very different. Yeah, it is. They went with this instead. Should we bring the ruckus? I suppose we should get into each of these tracks on this album. Ruckus. Ruckus, ruckus, ruckus. Nah, you brought the ruckus. It's here. So, Bring the Ruckus loosely begins a concept for the album wherein the Shaolin have taken over the world of rap and the Wu-Tang Clan have to step in and be the heroes that save the day. So it starts with this movie dialogue taken straight from the 1981 movie Shaolin and Wu-Tang, a movie that will come up frequently. I know you're not a fan, historically, of talking in songs. (laughs) right? We've had a few where you're like, the dialogue just takes me out of it. What? What is an album like this? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I'm not really in it yet, so if you're gonna do it, the beginning's probably the best spot. Well, there's other spots. (laughs) Yeah, the beginning and the end are the best places to put in dialogue if you're gonna put it. Was it a win? Is it a loss? How's it, like, right off the bat? What do you think? I think right off the bat here, I'm just gonna say I didn't really care. Okay. Specifically on this one, because it was right off the bat. Yeah, fair enough. The previews of a movie don't bring me out of the movie, but if they shoved a preview in the middle of Star Wars, I'd be like, what the heck is this? Yeah, but it it wouldn't be like, it's like a cut to something else in the Star Wars universe, maybe, instead of a preview. It's like part of what the album's supposed to be. Sure. There's definitely parts where they come back. It's, I'm trying to think of a good movie example where they do that. Where, like, there's, like, a really, like, a, a W plot going on, mm. you know, uh, in a movie where it's just, like, every once in a while they jump over to some character still just doing the exact same thing. Right. Standing on the street, spinning a sign or whatever. Just, like, every once in a while when all the other characters are up to something, they just cut to that person still spinning the sign and then cut back. It'd be like that. Like the cabbage guy in Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah, there you go. So it's, like, part of it, and it, it can be okay, but it's... It is a little jolting sometimes. Okay. It's a little jolting and can be done very poorly. Okay, I gotcha. Well, Bring the Ruckus starts it all off with that clip. And then the song is built itself on a few samples. Some of the drums are from Melvin Bliss's song, Synthetic Substitution. And they actually had trouble clearing a loop from a Carlos Best song that they had to replace. And we talked about Otis Redding's music being 
in elevators all the time, which was, of course, a spin. Not really true. But this music actually happened in an elevator. RZA said they wanted a good crash for the snare drum, so they put it at the bottom of an elevator shaft and recorded it, which is why it echoes so much when they hit that snare. Wow, are we in our elevator era? Uh, it sounds like we're going up to it. But what a spectacular sound. I just love it. I like some of the verses. There's some interesting lyrics in here. Yeah, you're going to find a lot of interesting lyrics throughout the album. I feel like we just can't focus too much on the lyrics because yeah. here's the thing. When you've got an album made by eight, nine different guys and they're all doing verses and they're all contributing stuff, there's a lot of lyrics. That's, I guess, the thing I've always appreciated most about rap music is clever, like, real world references in their lyrics like the way that they work in analogies to things or references to things, mm -hmm. but yet still keep it like within the point of what they're trying to say. I've always admired that aspect of rap. It's just usually the execution of those lyrics that I struggle with. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, there's definitely spots in this song, you know, master the trick, just like Nixon, right? They reference real things and they throw all kinds of allusions to stuff in there. Yeah. I mean, like, you got Wu-Tang Clan sparks the wicks and however I master the trick just like Nixon. <laughs> Is that how you pronounce that? Yeah. Or, like, to Waco, Texas. I blow spots like Waco, Texas. That's a hilarious line, if you know what that's referencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And it's just, it's interesting because there's such a cohesive, like, feel to the whole album. But within each song, you get a different flavor for each different MC that's taking a verse. And so it can get to be a lot just within a track. I come rough, tough, like an elephant tusk. Your head rush, fly like Egyptian musk. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if I knew there was that many words that rhymed with tusk. Yeah, see, I know. They really have a way with lyrics that you just find so many places on this album. Creeping up on sight, now it's Fright Night. It's a shame. What do you mean it's a shame? What's a shame? Track two. Track two. Oh, yeah, there's a... I couldn't make a smooth transition with the full title of that one. <laughs> no, to... no. I had to just leave it at shame. Shame. Yeah, there's a full title that we're not going to say. But <laughs> the clean version is Shame on a Nah, and you can infer. Definitely a difference between the album version and a clean version. Also, I should say, too... There's some different versions of this album available on streaming, and it confused the crap out of me. Really? The one I listened to initially was only nine tracks long, and it was missing some of these songs. Especially, I think, Bring to Ruckus wasn't even on it. And so... Oh, wow. I know. I went to look up stuff for this episode, and I was like, I haven't listened to the full album. Like, what did I hear? And it had <laughs> some of the edited stuff and some of the cleaner stuff. I was like, I gotta get to the full thing. And so, yeah, do some research out there. This one that we're talking about has 15 songs on it, and that seems much more like the kind of album it would have been. But Shame is up next. Fans really love the production and the mix on this one. It's another example of that underground hardcore rap. In my opinion, the best part of the song is the horn section, which, no surprises there, seems to be a running theme that we like. But that and the bass come from a 1968 song called Different Strokes by Syl Johnson. They also sample bits of a 1956 Thelonious Monk cover of a Duke Ellington song called Black and Tan Fantasy. That's the little discordant piano part at the end. So this is like low-key spin cycle, a cover of a Duke Ellington song. It's spin cycle adjacent. Murder, taste the flame of the Wu-Tang. Ra. Here comes the tiger versus crane. Yeah, you're going to find a lot of instances of lyrics like that. Flame of the Wu-Tang. It's Wu-Tang feels like it could be like a condiment of some sort. Really? What? Maybe that's just the fact that I know Tang is a drink. Tang is a flavor. You know, Tang is like a quality of flavor. Uh, yeah. And maybe that's biasing me. Yeah. I don't know. Like, couldn't you imagine just seeing, like, going into, like, one of the hot sauce aisles at a place that has, like, a ton of different hot sauces and, like, seeing one called Flame of the Wu-Tang? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could. Flame of the... Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Notable lyric. Uh, not too many artists, you see, use the word gonorrhea. No. That is... That is a rare one. <laughs> or at least... Or at least I've never heard it, if they have. Yeah. Got burnt once. Like, they think that they've been double-crossed, but really, it wasn't that kind of burnt. It was a different burning sensation. Well, I just love it. They go, burn me, I get into it, I let it out like diarrhea. Got burnt once, but that was only gonorrhea. Like, dang. Yep. <laughs> All the rias. <laughs> I don't know how many rias there are, but that's probably two of the most prominent ones. <laughs> This song also starts with another one of those film samples. Does it pull you out of it if they start every track with one? Or does that become normal at some point? It still did. So I think this album gets away with it for the most part. Mm. Because 
they're not singing at all. <laughs> True, fair point. It's rap or it's a sample. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just them speaking. It's rapping. They're you know, it's a sample or they're just like speak rapping. You know, so when they switch to just a sample of somebody talking, it doesn't necessarily pull me out of it. As long as there's still music behind it, like they typically mm -hmm. dub music over top of their film samples and stuff. And when they do that, it's fine. It's when all of a sudden there's nothing but that sample that I kind of go, okay, whatever. Where's the music? Right, which is frequently. But this album is such a novelty, such a concept in itself. You're right. I think gets away with it. It's probably a fair way to put it. <laughs> like, I recognize that they're doing it, and I'm not happy about it, but I also can't really complain. No, it's their style. It's going on their permanent record, but I'm not taking action as of yet. It's what their music is built around. That means given a yellow card. Okay. Soccer player. What do you think about Clan in the Front? In the Front, please. The Front. Clan in the Front. I like the plunky little piano on this one. Mm-hmm. Also, I love the references to different artists, like Fitzgerald. Yes. I gamed Ella. She caught a Fitz like Gerald. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of all the things you've been talking about lately. And then in the Geraldine Ferraro. Like, it was really clever how they combined Ella Fitzgerald and Geraldine Ferraro. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Indiana Jones gets a reference. We love Indiana Jones. This song is also built on a Thelonious Monk sample of a song called Balu Bolivar Balu R. And it also features a bit of Honeybee by The New Birth. So that's where that piano comes from. And I like it a lot. Jizza was the primary driving element behind this song. There's some interesting reasons for that. He said, with eight or nine people on a song, if you go last, you're going to get cut on the video or the mix show. So he says, you know what? I'm going to go first on this song. I'm going to go first on Clan in the Front. So he lays down his part, and everyone else just kind of decides they don't want to follow him up. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, they're like, yeah, well, we're good. Yeah, they said, okay. Yeah, yeah, we can't follow that. You you take it. You know what? You do it. If you go first but nobody else goes, you also have gone last, and therefore we can cut it. Get wrecked. Oh, well. Yeah, you're right. It kind of went against his plan. It's rare that so few members appear on a track, as you could probably tell just from looking at the track list in the album credits. I mean, he laid down a lot. He, he, he went for it and crushed it, really. To the point, I feel like this song is four and a half minutes long. It really doesn't feel it. This is a, a quick track in my brain. I don't know if you felt that way about any of these tracks. I just, I don't know. This isn't your thing, usually. At this point, I've lost all meaning of time in this album. It's all bled together already. Oh, uh, no, already? We're on track three. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> this is an hour and ten minute record. <laughs> uh-huh. We're on minute, what, eight? Oh, dear. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, the fourth track on the album. This is the first one that I feel like didn't get away with it. Oh, Seventh Chamber? It's like a minute in or longer before there's any music. That's true. They start with a skit, which is, again, not super uncommon for rap at all, especially in this era. But you're right. There's a long time before we get a verse. But you know what? Why is this song called Seventh Chamber, you may ask? It's track four. That doesn't make any sense. That's because there are seven different members on this song. So, you know, keeping with that theme, 36 Chamber theme. And also, members of the group released other chambers on some of their solo projects to try and make it to 36. Oh, so there had already been six? I don't know if there had already been six. And in fact, I don't even know how many of the 36 exist out there. But they did keep that theme running throughout everything else. Spin cycle alert, though. Not tangential. Actual, bona fide, 100% spin cycle alert. Seventh chamber samples Otis Redding's Down in the Valley. Oh. Yeah, we just talked about that, what, two, three, four weeks ago? It's been a minute, but we talked about it. That's crazy. I know, right? And you can almost hardly even recognize it in there. It also samples Lonnie Smith's song, Spinning Wheels. And this one's a unique track because it comes back in what's basically a glorified remix. Same vocals and everything. We could talk about how that landed when we get to it later on in the album. But Seventh Chamber's not done yet. Up next, though, is Can It Be All So Simple. I really like Can It Be All So Simple. Personally, that's a win for me. And so did the general public. It peaked at number 24 on Billboard's Hot Rap Singles charts. This one actually has a little bit of singing, a little out of the rapping. It samples some singing. Did that help any? Not really, no. Really? Wow. Well, the singing is Gladys Knight, whom you may know from Midnight Train to Georgia. It's her song, The Way We Were, and the song is all about reminiscing. So that's what they rap about over and around the sample, is the way things used to be, thinking back on what things were like when they were growing up, their family life, the good old days. I really thought you'd have a better chance of liking Can It Be All So Simple. Oh, uh, 
I didn't. It was all right. I'll be honest. The music did more for this one than the sampled singing. I like the little, the more subdued, just plunking sound on this one. Yeah. Some held out notes. The boom, boom, boom. You know that it was just doing. That's true. It's a softer song. It's still got the lyrical edge, but definitely eased back a little bit. Yeah. What did you think? This is one I'm excited to talk about. What do you think about the mystery of chess boxing? Mm, I don't know, but I know how I felt about the mystery of chess boxing. That's semantics. Okay. <laughs> chess boxing was the B-side to Cream, and it was inspired by and named after the 1979 movie Mystery of Chess Boxing, which features a character known as the Ghost-Faced Killer. So this was an inspiration for them in more way than one. I like the sound of this one. The doo do 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 Like that little, what is that, a guitar? Whatever they sample there sounds really great. Yeah, it's good. Do you know about chess boxing? Is that where every time you want to take a piece, you have to do a boxing match to... You, you laugh, but almost. I feel like that's it. <laughs> it's actually a real sport. Chess boxing is where people play chess, and then they box back and forth. And it ends when someone either gets a checkmate or a knockout. It's unreal. I did some research because I was curious, and I thought the mixtaper almost would even bring it up in Factor Spin. Who knows? But the sport started in the underground in London because two boxing brothers would play chess every time after they trained. They'd finish training, and then they'd play chess, and I guess they wanted to spice it up. Keeps the mind sharp. Yeah. So the Kung Fu movie, like, solidified the concept, but Wu-Tang Clan really brought it into the limelight with this song. It's, it's a mystery to me, chess boxing is. <laughs> Because who, what audience is this for? That's what I want to know. Who's who's the target audience of chess boxing? People who are like the hipsters of the boxing world. Maybe. Or the hipsters of the chess world. I know. Maybe they come together and form one big hipster conglomerate of chess boxing. Maybe. I just sent you a video. Look at it. You could see a few minutes of chess boxing. Wild. I know, right? So weird. I know. They do the anthem and everything. It's like official. And there's a lot of people there. The mystery of chess boxing features Master Killer and You Got, and actually it was the first time Master Killer tried his hands at writing lyrics at all. In fact, he really never even rapped at all before this song came up. So, congrats. I think it's a great debut. Hey. Hey. The Spinning Podcast ain't nothing to mess with, all right? Yeah, we're not nothing to mess with, and so is the Wu-Tang Clan. Ain't nothing to F with. That's the next song. This song, did you recognize any samples in this one? Was I supposed to? Maybe. You grew up. On a lot of cartoons, you talk frequently about like Looney Tunes, like the Hanna Barbera cartoons and stuff. Yeah. The sample in this song is from Underdog, the 1960s cartoon. Oh. Yeah. Wu Tang Clan ain't nothing to f with, and neither is Underdog. It's incredibly clever because they're the underdogs in the rap world, emerging from the literal unknown and immediately at the top of their game. They're the underdogs, and just like the superhero, they're not to be trifled with. It's amazing. I just, you can never even recognize it. It came about because RZA had a CD with a bunch of old cartoons and kid songs, and he was working with it, and this song just stuck. He started chopping it up and messing with it in all kinds of ways. Apparently, he actually had to use some production tricks to cover up a scratch or a skip in the recording that he had on the CD. I like the song. I think it's all right. I like it more now that I know it's sampled underdog. I know. See, that's what I love about these episodes is you get into what these songs are made up of and like how they came to be. For me, it's given me a lot more appreciation for a lot of different music. And as much as I like that song, though, I definitely like Cream better. This is a way more well-known song. Cash rules everything around me. It was like a major pillar of the genre. What about this one? Did this one get you at all? Uh, yeah, I'll spill my hand a little bit here. This one was probably my favorite song. Whoa, Cream, really? Okay. I liked it. It's kind of clever. It did its best. I'd still probably take 90%. You know, so obviously this is going to be my playlist pick. Oh, obviously. Okay. <laughs> I think I'd still take literally any other song on... Not maybe any, but most other songs on the playlist than this one. But wow. this one was my favorite on this album. Okay. I think it's a lot of fun. The song samples As Long As I've Got You by the Charmels, and it was originally recorded way back in 1991. Didn't make it onto an album until now. Uh, but RZA said, once we got into the studio, I decided that this track had to be on the Wu-Tang album. Method Man, the master of hooks at the time, came in with the hook. Cash rules everything around me, cream, get the money. Once he added that element, I knew it was going to be a smash which I like it. And it's also a very personal song to them, too. Raekwon said, when I think of this record, it automatically puts me back into 87, 88, where we were standing in front of the building. It's cold outside. We didn't care. We were just out there trying to make dollars, trying to make some money and trying to eat. So it's like a very fundamentally 
uh, almost a biography of their experience at that time. Cream peaked at number 60 on the Billboard Hot 100. Once again, just unbelievable for a band coming out of the New York underground. One thing I'll say about Cream, I mean, I like the acronym, I like the idea, I like the execution. I think that little piano sample gets a little bit played out by the end of four and a half minutes, or 412, really. It's not bad, but it does it does go on a little bit. Yeah. What's turned out to be one of my favorite songs on the record is Method Man. You like Method Man a lot, huh? I did, actually, and do. I did and do. This is another one that didn't get away with it because of how actually melodic Cream was. I was pulled right out of it by the beginning of Method Man. Yeah, it starts with this really interesting, violent skit. It's the band playing a game of one-upsmanship called Torture, where they try and outdo one another with more atrocious methods of torture. So it's a little... <laughs> It's a little much. But, of course, that, like so many other elements of this record, are only on the album version. The single version, you won't hear that at all. Which is more proof that I'm a singles guy. I I guess you are. The whole album is not getting the job done for you today. It's one of the very rare solo Wu-Tang tracks. The rumor has it that it's the result of a nine-way rap battle with each member, and the prize for the winner was a solo track on the debut record. Guess who won? I'll give you a hint. It was Method Man. What did I say? Was it Method Man? Yeah, it was. Considering that's the name of the song? Yeah, and he's <laughs> really the only guy on it. M-E-T-H-O-D, Man, has been stuck in my head constantly since I heard this. Like, too much. I like some of the references he makes in this. Don't eat Skippy Jif or Peter Pan peanut butter. You know, Sam I Am, Don't Eat Green Eggs and Ham. Yep. Master the Plan, rapping stuff like Saran, Saran rap. I, there's just so many little clever bits of lyric in here. I like Method Man a lot. I don't think it's going to end up as my playlist pick. I haven't thoroughly decided yet. Really? I don't think it is, but I like it a lot, so there. Up next, though, is probably the biggest Wu-Tang song from these early days. Shoot, they wanted to make their whole logo after it, for crying out loud. It's Protect Your Neck. The big bad debut single. Really? It's not the most popular on Spotify. It's in third place. I know, but it was a big one. Uh, Pitchfork actually would go on to deem Protect Your Neck the number five best track of the 1990s, which is, that's, that's a high accolade. Protect Your Neck was originally supposed to be the posse cut for the album, and uh, Method Man says, everybody that showed up with $100 got on the record. He said the order that people wrapped in just happened. We all went in there one after another, and it just fit. It wasn't go back in and put this verse here and move this verse there. They just walked in, nailed it. The beginning part of Protect Your Neck, the skit part, comes from a call someone made to a city college radio station to request their music, and it was meant to show, meant to illustrate, that people were loving what the band's been up to, what they've been making. Did you like Protect Your Neck? Was it another full miss? Did it bring back the piano? It goes, butta, butta. And I felt like I heard that on an earlier track, but I couldn't tell. Or if it's just the whole bleeding together thing made me think. I think that's your brain playing tricks on you. It's bleeding together a little bit, but that piano is very similar to the Thelonious Monk symbol that we got on, on what was it, Clan in the Front? Yeah. It's very reminiscent of that. Interestingly, on Protect Your Neck, they self-censor some of their curse words, which was different, but very intentional. And it wasn't an attempt to make the song clean. It was just an attempt to be different. That was something that a lot of people and a lot of rappers weren't doing. So they did it to truly make this their own unique song. And it honestly, it plays right into the album's concept. If you don't protect your neck in the 36th chamber, you're going to get your head chopped off. You're going to be a part of that logo. Don't do it. <laughs> Up next is Tears with a Z. Thank you for calling out proper Tears. Tears. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I was clear. So you should have recognized Tears a little bit. Should I have? Yeah, I know you should have. This didn't ring any bells for you. No. Wow. Not one. Let me think. I gotta think back. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Think back. No. Go click play on Ariana Grande's fake smile. Oh. <laughs> yeah. See? There it is. What? I warned you at the time it would come up again. And I even mentioned this album by name there. This song, Tears and Fake Smile, prominently sample Wendy Renee's song, After Laughter Comes Tears, from 1964. A mere eight episodes ago, we had this very same sample. That was only how many episodes ago? Eight. That was only eight ago? Yes. I mean, it's two months, but still. I know. It feels like a whole different frame of time 
time from that. Other samples on Tears come from Wilson Pickett's Get Me Back on Time engine number nine. And like they have with Underdog and with Can It All Be So Simple, uh, the sample parallels what the song's about. Good times are always followed by hard times. It's laughter, then it's tears. There's always the promise of good things, even in the midst of hard times. Tears was actually initially the B-side to Protect Your Neck. I see. Mm -hmm. I just, I love the sound of this one. They've just picked some really great samples. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I actually, I kind of liked that opening sample too. It's crazy. I've heard it before and didn't realize it. Didn't even, didn't even click. I know. Maybe we have to put Wendy Renee in that song on the spin cycle so we can get it in our brains good. I think we do. Mm -hmm. And up next is what I mentioned way earlier, Seventh Chamber Part 2. It's a reworking of the first round of Seventh Chamber. The vocals are the same, but RZA engineered a brand new beat to put behind it. Kind of a remix built into the record. I don't know if you even have an opinion on this. Not really. Which one did you like better? Was there a difference? Yes, but that's exactly how I figured you'd respond. I think I like the second one better. Then me too. Or if you'd rather be different so that we always win no matter what the audience feels. I prefer the first one. That's so they always have someone to pick that agrees with them. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. This song also features a big interview style conclusion to end the album where this third party kind of offers commentary for a minute. And of course, one last sample from Shaolin and Wu-Tang proclaims, it's a secret, never teach the Wu-Tang. And then they break into fighting before a few tags of the iconic, you best protect your neck. And that concludes Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers. We made it. I survived. I We survived the 36 Chambers, that's right. I've survived that album many a time. You just had to make it through once. It was a struggle. Well, you did it, though. I'm also curious about your opinion on this, okay? Okay. There were three pairs of singles released for the album. I want to know what you think is the best pair. One pair is Protect Your Neck and Method Man. One pair is Cream and The Mystery of Chess Boxing. One pair is Can It Be All So Simple and Wu-Tang Clan Ain't Nothing to F With. <sighs> Ooh. I know. Either number two or three. Yeah, we'll go with two. Okay. Wait, which one had cream? Two. Yeah, cream and, and chess boxing. Yeah, number two. <laughs> you take cream and chess boxing. My favorite pair of singles was Protect Your Neck and Method Man. Yeah, I knew it would be. I know, I know. Well, let's get into final spin. Let's talk scores for the album. And to be clear, Cream's doing like 90% of the heavy lifting. I know. But chess boxing, <laughs> what a cool sport. Oh, I am so excited to hear your thoughts, final thoughts on this album. I think they're going to be uh, scathing, honestly. But you can't offend me. This was a listener recommendation, so. Yeah, which is the sad part. I'm supposed to be the people's champion. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot all about that. Listen, as the people's champion. It's my duty, my solemn vow to always do what is best for the people, even if that's tell them they're wrong. Wow. Okay. Way to spin that. Heavy is the crown, as they say. What? Heavy? It's not what they say. I don't heavy know. Heavy is what the I head. <laughs> heavy is the there, head. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. But the reason the head is so heavy is because the crown it's is heavy. heavy. You're right. Crown. So you just cut out the middleman. Yeah, I just shortened it because everybody knew what it was. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you got to protect your neck because your head is so heavy. Yeah. Well, as for me, my scores are pretty straightforward. Music, it's a 78. There's uh, a lot of... A lot, a lot of rapping. A lot, a lot of looping samples. There's nothing much. There's a few hooks that get really deep, like M-E-T-H-O-D man and cream, dollar dollar bills, y'all. It's there. So 78 for music. Lyrics, I'm also given a 78. A lot of interesting internal rhymes. So, so, so many lyrics. I want to know what the word count on this album is, because it's got to be, I mean, triple what we normally have. <laughs> as far as lyrics go, at least. Instruments of production, given an 82. I think RZA does a great job here. He is good at what he does. He's known for what he does for a reason. I like a lot of the samples they picked, and I like the way that they write their lyrics to match the samples that they pick. Underdog, Tears, all these songs build on, lyrically, the themes that match the samples they're taking from. So there's a lot of intentionality behind it that I really like. Overall vibe, I'm giving it an 84. This album was revolutionary for the genre. It's novel in its concept and it sticks to the concept through and through i mean the kung fu movies and stuff maybe it's not your cup of tea it's not necessarily my cup of tea but they commit to the bit if you could call it that so 84 on that puts the overall score at an 80.6 from me lands it at number 466 which puts it below blondie's parallel lines that we talked about on episode 63 but above me and my gang by rascal flats in episode 18 so that's where it goes for me huh yeah 
As for me... Do it. Hit me with it. My top three in album order. I forgot. Yeah, give me your top three. What could you possibly have as your top three? I get all my picks, right? Yeah, last week you had all your picks. This week you have all your picks. Like honorable mention, Bring the Ruckus. Right off the bat. Okay. Can it be all so simple? Big jump, but I thought that one would be on your short list, so that's good. Cream. Dollar Dollar Bills. We already spoiled was my playlist pick. Yeah, that's true. And tears tears okay that spans the album that's good it's because those uh tracks did something to wake me up from the stupor i got into after track three they blitzed you yeah i mean really the album feels like you got blitzed yeah as for my score all i can say is somebody's not gonna be so lonely anymore at the bottom oh my goodness we've got three artists down here that are all alone we've got kid cutting down here at a score of one Radiohead down here with a score of two, and the Monkees down here with a score of three, all alone. Oh, you're going to give someone a friend. <laughs> Somebody's getting a buddy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a rare day. It is a rare day. A low for the year of healing, really. Uh-huh. It's a different kind of healing. Sure. Like I said, this is me telling the audience, get their crap together. Okay. A little tough love in the year of healing. Sure. James, you're off the hook. I'm off the hook. You have no longer made me listen to my least favorite album of the podcast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is getting a one and going below Kid Cudi. <laughs> the, I, to be fair too, Kid Cudi wasn't really your least favorite, right? He was just retribution for Kanye. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But Radiohead <laughs> definitely was your least favorite and i absolutely did that to you so yeah <laughs> wow so this is a one yeah this one is getting one flavor of tang wow not even a second flavor nope because this whole album felt like just one tangy soup oh oh <laughs> with a little bit of cream with a little bit of cream a little <laughs> Tangy soup with a little bit of cream. That was this album. I'm disappointed, but not surprised. I knew this is how you'd end up feeling about this one. Yeah. So now you can either make it your goal to reclaim the worst album or to stay away from the worst album. Whatever you well, prefer, really. Kind of got two directions here. I'd sure like to stay away from the worst album. Know, it could be kind of like a fun challenge to try to find something worse than that that is still worth bringing to the podcast. I've got it. <laughs> Got it lined up. Oh, okay. If you want it, I can fire at any time, but I'll hold off for now. Oh, okay. I knew this would be a hard sell. I am slightly disappointed, but again, what are you going to do? We're exploring different kinds of music. Yeah. All kinds of music. So you're taking Cream. My playlist pick, I really thought about Method Man. I really did. I almost want it, but I feel like I have to go for Protect Your Neck a little bit. Do what you want. I just don't like that Method Man is a solo track. I think if we're really going to be representative of this album, a solo track is obviously something we should stay away from. So, Fair enough. Chess boxing's fun. I feel like you're going to Protect Your Neck. I think I have to. It's, it's a good choice. Well, there you have it. There you do have it. Cream and Protect Your Neck. Put a little cream on your neck to protect it. A little sunscreen. S sunscreen. <laughs> a little sunscreen on. <laughs> Yeah, that brings us to the end of another episode of Spin It. Next week, we'll be back into the year of healing. Again, this pick, thank you so much to Nor, friend of the colonel, for this pick. We really appreciated it. I really enjoyed it and then liked learning about it. Sorry, Nor, but I had to I had to put you in your place. Connor eviscerated your pick. I had to lay down the law. Sorry. Right. Tune in next week. We'll be back on for the year of healing. Well, this is still a year of healing. Yeah, yeah. I'm stoked. We'll be back for another healing session in seven short days. That's right. And until then... You can Keep find us. Spinning. Good grief. Oh, wait. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was early. Until then, you can find us on social media at Spin It Pod Official on Instagram and at Spin It Pod on X and Twitter and other things. And you can find us on the web at www.spinitpod.com. That's the best place to find us. Heck yeah. We're there all the time. All sorts of fun stuff. Blooper reels, bonus content, B-side, longer cuts of certain episodes. All the thing emo bobs. I've heard good things about our B-side of Taylor Swift. I've gotten several comments on it. Really? Yeah. Wow, cool. That's exciting. Be sure to follow, subscribe, like, rate, five stars, or however many stars you feel so inclined to rate. All the things. It really helps. Annoyingly, it helps. It helps a lot. And no, oh, you can also follow our favorite songs playlist. It's on Spotify, and we have one on YouTube, but... It's a great playlist for a car ride. It's a great playlist for everything. Well, maybe not everything. I can think of a few situations where maybe it's not the greatest, but... Well, that's not important now. It's the greatest for everything. Tell a friend who likes Tang, still, who still likes Tang. Yeah. 
Tell a friend who's tried the weird strawberry thing. Tell a friend who's who's a nice orange strawberry about the podcast. And until next week, keep, keep spinning. spinning. I owe you an apology. Yeah? Yeah, well, two episodes ago, we talked about Avril Lavigne having a lighter up moment at the concert. And then we talked about how people don't have lighters anymore. And you said people would put their vapes up. Uh-huh. I said, well, that wouldn't have the same effect because vapes don't light up. I was at a concert the other night and I saw someone with a light up vape. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I take it all back. Well, I appreciate that. That was very big of you. Don't ever question me again. Well, <laughs> the people's champion. <laughs> <laughs>